What's going on my dudes? This is Dustin Stelzer with Electrician U and today we're going to talk about wiring with MC. What is MC? MC is a type of cable assembly. Uh, meaning that it's conductors inside of a jacketing that you use to wire usually commercial buildings uh, It can be wired in a lot of different places But the majority of the time that you're gonna see it you're probably gonna be doing stuff in commercial buildings or garages um, Typically MC is not used in homes Though it could be and a lot of people get MC and AC confused. So AC is another cable assembly. It's got conductors in it. It's got a metal spiral bound sheathing just like MC does. So a lot of people don't know what the differences are, but there's a very specific use for MC and a very specific use for AC. The difference with AC is that there are conductors on the inside, but the equipment grounding conductor inside is a uh, really skinny piece of the wire. Whereas MC has an actual either insulated or bare uh, full-sized equipment grounding conductor in it. Um, some versions of MC actually have a second equipment grounding conductor in it, usually for bonding or for isolated ground. It can be used indoor or outdoor. Uh, it's, it's meant for dry locations, so it can get a little confusing when you say outdoor, but you don't list anywhere in the code that it can be used in damp environments. The only thing that MC's talked about is indoor or outdoor or dry or wet. There's no distinction for damp environments. So while it does say that you can use it outdoor, the actual UL listings for MC don't say that the jacketing is rain tight um, or that it has any kind of moisture protection. The conductors on the inside most of the time are THHN or THWN. Um, a lot of them offer some sort of uh, damp location or wet location protection, but that's just the conductors inside of the sheathing. So the sheathing itself is not weatherproof. So while you can run it outside, you have to kind of be careful on where you're using it and how you're using it. Yo, Paul, what do we do when we're working with MC and we run into wet or damp locations? In a wet location, in order to use a type MC cable in that application, and in accordance with 330.12, which says that if you have a product and you install it in a certain environment, then it has to be rated for that environment. Well, there you go. So now I have a PVC jacketed MC product. Now, this is a standard MC. It's going to have an equipment grounding conductor inside there, but it also has a PVC jacket that is impervious to moisture, and that's the wet location. Now, if I'm going to terminate this product in a wet location, then I need to have a fitting that's rated for a wet location. So this happens to be another fitting by Bridgeport that is rated for a wet location. And that's where the termination would be, then you'd need this type of fitting. Keeps moisture from getting into the ends and into the equipment. Now, what about if I'm using this product in a wet location, but the terminations or the resulting terminations end up in a dry location? Then I can use a standard fitting for the termination here because it's in a dry location. This fitting is not being subjected to a wet location. But the cable itself might be running through a wet location, then that's acceptable because this is impervious to wetness and it is rated and identified for a wet location. If the termination is in a wet location, then I have to have this type fitting. If it's in a dry location, just the termination portion, I can use a standard dry location type fitting. Okay, so this is a wet location good for use on parking decks. Uh, this is rated for direct burial. It'll be marked right on the side. I can put this in the ground. A lot of uses that I can use a PVC jacketed MC product in damp and wet locations. MC can be used in both uh, exposed or in concealed environments. So a lot of people think, well, you can't put MC on a wall and run it down a wall. You absolutely can. Sheetrock doesn't matter what it is. It can be exposed. Um, it doesn't look as great and you usually need to strap it a lot more than the minimums that you're required to strap it just to kind of keep it running straight and a lot of times if you're using like one hole straps or something and you try to pull that thing straight and strap it again it pulls through that connector so or through that strap so it ends up just being crappier trying to do this as, as like pretty 
neat exposed work. So I personally, just a preference, but I personally think just using conduit rather than MC where it's gonna be exposed, um, especially in long runs of it, I think uh, using conduit is probably a better way to go. But again, that's not what the minimum standards of the NEC says. It's absolutely okay by the NEC, by code, to be using this in exposed places. <clears throat> Today's episode is brought to you by Rogers Electric. It'll blow your mind. Now, for real, I have gotten to know Rogers for quite a while now. I've got to go out to the field and work with their guys. I've gotten to meet their corporate office. Um, so I know a little bit about what they do and how they do it. They seem to place um, quality and education very, very highly. Uh, they specialize in commercial service work. They do construction as well, but there's quite a bit that they do. Um, if any of you are interested at all in seeing what Rogers is about, there is a link in the description below. Now, some of the uses that are not permitted for it, it's not allowed to be used in areas where it's subject to a, uh, damage. So that means if like a piece of equipment or somebody's like moving around something and they hit that conductor, well, that stuff, if you bend it, I mean, it's pretty easy to break it. It's pretty easy to smash it. Um, so you can't use it in environments where it's going to get damaged very easily. You also can't use it in environments where uh, corrosion is an issue unless you're using a variation of the many kinds of MC that are out there that has a coating over it or something that protects it from that corrosion. Let's talk a little bit about securing and supporting. So right now we're in 330.30 and uh, it puts securing and supporting together, but they are two different things. So what's the difference between securing and supporting? Securing is literally taking something and securing a conductor to something. So putting a strap on it, locking it in place. Whereas supporting is just holding up essentially. So like when you run across uh, trusses or rafters up in a ceiling, every, every time that that uh, conductor is laying on something, it's being supported by something. Um, so with MC securing and supporting, it's still a six foot rule. So within six feet, you have to secure and support. Um, there's a couple of different times where that doesn't really matter. Um, like if you're in a vertical run down a wall and you have conductors that are like 250 kc mil or larger, uh, you can support or you can secure every 10 feet or within 10 feet. You can't exceed 10 feet. But the thought there is that those conductors are so massive that there's not a lot of like flexibility or give to them. So it's almost like sticking a pipe on a wall because they're so, uh, they're so big and they're so rigid. Another thing that people get wrong a lot is that they think that every piece of MC has to be strapped within a foot of every box or cabinet. Um, and that's, it's true up to a certain point. So if you have a piece of MC that has four or fewer conductors in it that are number 10 or smaller, then you have to secure that MC within 12 inches of a box or cabinet um, or another strap or even a fitting within 12 inches of that fitting. Uh, so it's not every type of MC that you have to do that for. It's just those specific four conductors or less, number 10 or less. So that's all in the vein of securing. So supporting again is very, uh, very much the same. If you're running across something every 18 inches, like you're golden, uh, but there is, situations where you don't really have to have supporting um, as long as you're within six feet of a piece of equipment in certain circumstances you're okay an example of this is say you're running in a uh, in inaccessible space and you're you're fishing mc through something that you there's no access to well obviously there's no access you can't get in there and strap so it's okay to do that per code and then if you're in an accessible ceiling and you've got some equipment or you've got some lighting and you can get up into that ceiling and access it, uh, there's an allowance in there that says that you only need to strap within six feet of that equipment. So the rest of that wire until it terminates into that light or that, that piece of equipment does not have to be supported or secured by anything. Another exception for uh, not supporting something is, say that you have a piece of equipment 
and you're using specifically interlocking type of MC, which is the most common that we use today pretty much everywhere. Um, but within three feet of a piece of equipment, if you need to have a little bit of slack so that there's no vibration that's being transmitted from the machine to that MC. Uh, you don't have to strap within three feet. As long as you strap at three feet, you're good. Or if that piece of equipment is gonna move a little bit, it's okay to leave a little bit of slack within three feet uh, of that piece of equipment. One other thing that a lot of people don't think about is that an MC fitting, like a connector, um, is actually considered a means of support. So when you're talking about these distances, it's not talking about just a box itself. It's saying any fitting is also a means of support. There's this whole debate on should you be using your dikes to like bend the, the sheathing and cut it, or should you be using channel locks to twist and, and cut it, or should you be using a roto splitter? It doesn't matter. None of that's to code. Any way that you want to do it is fine. There's no specific tool that the gods have ordained that you have to use for this. It's just that most people have a preference to use a roto splitter because that roto splitter um, has a wheel on it that's not going to damage the conductors on the inside and it's not going to penetrate too deeply. Um, plus, it leaves a clean cut. Whereas when you use dikes and you bend something over and try to uh, cut it, it like mangles everything up. But in either situation, it's your responsibility to clean the end of that sheathing up so that it doesn't damage the wire and the way that MC is designed and the MC connectors are there's supposed to be a flat surface on that sheathing that butts up to the flat surface on the inside of that connector. So it's up to you to cut it however the hell you want to, however you want to, but you have to clean it up and make it so that none of those conductors are going to get damaged or pinched or um, you just have to keep your conductors protected. All right, so you see how sharp that edge is? We use a roto splitter, which the roto splitter is designed to be used for this application. However, roto splitters use a, leave a really, really sharp edge on that wire. So watch what happens when this wire gets bent over inside of a box while you're making joints, it actually pierces the conductors. It doesn't do it every time, but there's a high risk of it doing that. That's why a lot of people just say to use those little um, red devils or anti-short bushings inside of them. but NEMA, if you read in the NEMA uh, manuals for their standards, what they say to do every time you use a roto splitter is to cut the sharp edge and try to square it. So that way when it hits the inside of the connector, it has a flat edge to hit and you have less of a risk of damaging that wire. Another hot topic is the use of redheads or red devils or anti-short bushings. The little red things that have the prong that stick out of them, they're plastic and they usually come taped to a thing of MC. Now, the manufacturers of MC say that those red devils are just put there in case you wanna use them. They just stick them in anyways, but you do not have to use them. If you look into Article 330 for MC, or you look into Article 320.40 for AC, both very similar, AC requires you to use those. You have to use them, it's in the code. MC doesn't say shit about it, so you do not have to use them. Anybody that tells you that doesn't know what they're talking about. Now, again, that is a minimum standard. So if you're always doing the minimums, then legally you're okay, technically you're all right but I don't like to wire things to the minimums. I like to overprotect, if anything, these are conductors. Now I do like using those redheads because it's just an extra layer of protection for your conductors. It's not going to hurt to use them and they come on the roll, like why not use them? It's protecting the inside of where the wire is and it's putting a layer between that sharp sheathing all the way around. Again, you don't have to, I like to use them. Do whatever your boss wants or whatever you want, um, but you're not breaking the law if you don't. Another issue, the whole Romex connectors on MC thing, they're not listed for that use. So this is another thing, if you go look in the NEMA manuals, you'll see how these pieces of material are meant to go together. All right, so the whole using Romex connectors on MC thing, you can't use a Romex connector on MC. Look at how big this hole is in relation to that MC. If I were to stick this MC through, it's gonna just keep going. It's not designed for MC. 
the listing standards for MC from both NEMA and UL um, say that you have to have a connector that has some sort of plate or stopping front on your connectors for MC. So this looks exactly like an MC connector, but the front of it's different. It's got a small hole that'll allow the conductors to go through, but that plate stops the MC. So the sheathing can't come flying through. So this is what you would typically call a Romex connector, but it's an MC connector. And this is approved for that, pur that purpose. Here's another version of an MC connector that's kind of similar. I hate these. There's no reason why that you need all this crap up here to get stuck when you're putting it in something. And I don't really like the fronts of these because they're a lot bigger, the hole is. So you can actually get the MC to kind of slide through it. It doesn't go all the way through, but it still pokes through, and I just don't like that. But it does have a stopping surface, so that is a listed connector for MC. Let's talk a little bit about bending space. So a lot of conductors have a bending space requirement, meaning that if you're gonna bend that conductor, you're gonna degrade the insulation a little bit if you go too far. You're gonna start allowing a point of degradation for that conductor. Um, so flexible conduits or flexible cable assemblies like MC, they still do have bending space requirements and they're different depending on what kind of MC you have. A lot of people when they're coming into a, a outlet box, they'll kind of come up and loop over the top, or if they're above, you know, they'll have to loop and bend this to get it into a box, but you don't want to bend it too much. Like, use your brain. I mean, you feel like the resistance of this thing is fighting you. That's probably a good diameter to go with. This is probably more than you need to be going with. You could go a little bit tighter, but you can start to feel when MC starts to give and when it starts to bend. So just don't over bend it. There are things in code, you can go and check out the bending requirements. Each type of MC has different requirements. Some of them are based off of like a 7X multiplier, 10X multiplier, 15X multiplier, all depending on what type of MC. Um, and it's all based off the, the outside diameter of uh, the, the sheathing that you're working with. Um, but again, just use common sense, like don't over bend it, or you're gonna end up with some crazy stuff like this, you know, where the end of it opens up. If you just use common sense, when you bend MC a certain amount, you can start to see the, the jacketing spread apart so you can see the conductors on the inside. At that point, you've pretty much broken the jacketing. So you wanna keep your bends really smooth and just use your head about it. You're trying to protect the conductors, in, the conductors inside. If you bend it too much, you're gonna start snapping that, plus you're gonna create a, a potential point of insulation breakdown if you get it a little bit too bound up inside of that jacketing. So some tips for using MC and wiring with it. I don't use a, a reel or a roller. Um, they are, they're actually tubs, like Racketeers makes one. It's a black tub. You stick a whole roll inside of it. There's a little hole in the side and you just pull your wire through that. You leave that thing in the middle of a room and you wire with it in the middle of the room and you're pulling from the outside of the roll. Totally okay to do. I just don't ever have like four of them and I need multiple if I'm pulling multiple home runs or something. They're like 150, 200 bucks a piece. So I've just never bought any of those, but I know I've worked for companies that do use them and do like using them and I still like them. It's just a preference thing really. But the other way to do it, a lot of construction people that do a lot of different pulls at different points uh, throughout their day and are using several different reels at the same time, they'll just go from the inside of the roll and they'll start bunching it up in their hands and start walking it away from the roll. They'll leave the roll in the middle of the room and they walk it out so they get a long straight piece of wire to work with and then you can kind of weave the wire. There's people out there that say, oh, that just takes too much time. You got to walk around and do that every single time. That's like time that you're losing. You know, that could be 30 minutes to an hour over the course of a day. And they're not wrong, you know, like that is one way to do it. Um, the advantage of having the roller is that you can roll your wire back up inside of that thing and you're saving more wire. You're not wasting that much because you can um, cut everything up, re-roll the wire back in. You're just not losing as much slack. But it also takes time to get used to that method of always having your roll in the center of the room and having to go back to that roll and having to reel it back up and carry that thing around with you and the disadvantage of 
having the cost of having those things, plus having to keep four of those in the back of your truck while you're driving around, you know, like I see both ways. I understand why people like it uh, with the rolls and I understand why people like to just peel off the reel by themselves, or you know, by itself. Okay, so if you notice on a brand new roll of MC, um, on the inside you have one free end of the wire and then on the outside you have the other free end of the wire. So there are reasons why people will pull from the inside versus pull from the outside. A lot of the rollers that you're going to get are like buckets that you stick this MC in, you peel off this end, stick it in a hole and you can just start pulling across a room and this whole thing just spins inside of that bucket. Some guys like that, it's really efficient. But the problem with it is most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time when you get MC, that back flat end is on the outside of that roll. The good smooth arrow end that goes in neatly comes from the inside of the roll. And that's almost on every version of MC that you get. That's why a lot of guys like to pick from the inside of the roll. And when you pick from the inside of the roll, then you can roll the wire out but it's just a little bit more difficult to work with when you're trying to pull from the outside when you don't have that arrow end in your favor. So if you can see, this has kind of a slight arrow shape that's going that way. Whereas on the back sides of each one of those arrows, it's a little bit more flat. Um, that's why MC, you need to pull in one direction and not pull the other direction. You have a hell of a time if you're trying to pull this way. So if you notice how MC goes in one direction really easily, now watch what happens when I try to pull the other direction. It will not come out. And the only way for me to back it out is to go very carefully, one at a time, every single chase. Sometimes you get lucky. But if I try to pull it back through, it comes really well. When all the studs are attached to the walls, it comes really easily. Another pro tip to think about is use gloves. Like wear gloves when you're dealing with MC. If you don't, you'll notice by the end of the day, your hands are filthy, your arms are filthy. The MC jacketing tends to be really oily and dirty. And so it collects, the more that oil gets on you and then you touch something else, you just gather all this crap all over your hands and your arms, you'll go to like wipe your sweat off your face and you'll just have this smear of black shit all over your face. So be really careful um, for professionalism's sake and looking like you know what you're doing. If you wear gloves, you're less likely to get yourself like stupid filthy. You'll still be pretty dirty by the end of the day. Not gonna lie, you're still gonna get stuff on your arms, but it compounds when you don't have gloves on and when you're not mindful of how filthy working with MC is. On that note also, I would think about the surfaces that you're working with MC around. Like if you've got nice painted walls that are white, don't push your reel all the way up against that wall. And then when you start pulling it and pulling it around corners and stuff, you're getting scuffs all over the wall. And I don't mean scuffs, I mean like, like black, blue, nasty, oily shit all over the walls. And it makes you look really unprofessional when you can't work cleanly. So on that note, working cleanly, one thing to think about with MC as well is while you're working with MC, you're using your roto splitter, you're peeling this metal sheeting off, usually you just throw it on the ground and then you take the plastic, unwrap it, cut it, throw it on the ground if you're up on a ladder or something like that. And then you're doing that again and again and again and before long you've got all this shit all over the floor. You've got metal sheeting, you've got either the paper that the stuff was wound with or plastic all over the place and then you got to spend time going around, bending down, picking all this stuff up at the end of the job for 30 minutes because you didn't just clean as you go. So one thing that I like to do is keep a bucket with me. You can keep a box, a small trash can that you get from your grocery store for like $5, but keep that around you. And every time you pull something off, you can even leave it at the bottom of your ladder and make a basketball thing out of it. I don't know, but like throw stuff in a box or a bucket and keep all of your trash collected as you're working the whole time. It makes you look a lot more professional and there's less shit to clean up at the end of the day. You've done all of your cleanup while you were working. So that's just a good pro tip to, to think about. And the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is being aware of not leaving MC hanging from a ceiling 
or leaving it, you know, sticking out of a wall where somebody can walk by and cut themselves. The ends of MC when you cut them are very, very sharp. And I can't tell you how many times I've been on a job site that we just roughed in and I'm walking through talking to somebody and I turn around and somebody left MC just hanging and it's like, boom, right in your eye where it clips your ear, just cuts your face, cuts the back of your head. It happens so often. Or somebody will leave it up, not secured anywhere. They're just resting it up somewhere and then it falls and it hits you and it just gouges and cuts you. Um, it's usually not that bad, but there are times where people have like lost an eye because of that kind of stuff. And especially when you've got customers walking through after everybody leaves for the day and they're kind of looking around to see what you guys did, the worst thing you could do is just have sharp objects hanging out everywhere for them to, to cut themselves on. So again, kind of a professionalism thing, but what I would do, say you're running some switch legs up into the ceiling and you're just leaving them looped up for right now, I would tape them up, you know, roll it all up, put some tape around it, put a zip tie, it doesn't matter. And then take a one hole strap and a screw and put the stuff up to the ceiling and screw it up in place so it's out of the way. Or you could wrap it around the joist and put a staple in it or something, but just keep it all secured. That way when you go back to the next day, all you gotta do is just yank this thing out and keep working on whatever you're doing. Um, so think about that kind of stuff and thinking about what we do as electricians is really not all that difficult. When you think about at the core of what it is, we are protecting conductors, we're protecting equipment, and we're protecting people's lives. That's pretty much it. Like, yeah, we're running power to stuff and we're controlling how power runs to things and how it's logically controlling, turning on, turning off. But the essence of why all of these codes and standards and UL listings and NEMA books and the NFPA and the NEC, why all of these things are made is because really what we're doing is trying to protect, protect the materials that we're installing. We're protecting whatever big ass piece of equipment we're hooking up so it doesn't burn up and there's not a liability lost and we're protecting people's lives so people don't get hurt, get shocked, get killed with the stuff that we work with. So on that note, I'm gonna stop yelling at y'all. I love y'all. Do good work. Think about how you're doing what you're doing and why you're doing it and give a shit about what you're doing. Love you people and I will see you in the next episode.